Coming up, the picturesque town of Amityville, New York, home to the world's most famous haunted house. In Amityville, it was the day that lives in infamy when Ronald DeFeo took a high-powered rifle and took the lives of his parents, brothers and sisters. I couldn't stop if I wanted to. I thought somebody was inside moving me. Thirteen months later, a new family moved into the house on Long Island. There was a clanging, there was a banging, there was a scraping and discovered they were not alone. Whatever was there was very intelligent, very impatient. Its abilities are more powerful than we really understand. It was December of 1975 when George and Kathy Lutz crossed the threshold of their dream house on Ocean Avenue. 28 days later, they abandoned the home, terrified by a series of bizarre and mysterious incidents. What's the truth behind the so-called haunted house and the real-life horror story that inspired a best-selling book and a hit movie? Join us for Amityville, The Haunted. Amityville, a quaint village on the south shore of Long Island, about an hour's drive from the hustle and bustle of New York City. A seemingly ordinary American town whose name is derived from the Latin word for friend. Yet it is also a name that remains inextricably linked to a series of events that began with the brutal murder of an entire family and ended with another family's nightmare. The story became known to the world as the Amityville Horror, but it's a story that the people of this closed-door community would just as soon forget. All that publicity and the movies I thought were ridiculous too. And I just didn't believe it. <laughs> I guess I don't believe the supernatural. It's the drunk kids that come back looking for a thrill night. They have nothing to do. So they, oh, let's go to Amityville and find the house. Long before gaining notoriety for its house of horrors, Amityville was a community rich in history. Will Rogers uh, lived here. Annie Oakley was here. Goddard, the great uh, space flight uh, engineer, shot off the first rocket here. Even George Washington uh, spent a day here supping, as he said in his diary, as he completed his tour of Long Island. But for nearly three decades, a certain house on Ocean Avenue has attracted more attention than any other landmark and cast an ominous shadow over this otherwise idyllic coastal village. This modern-day horror story has its origins in the history of Amityville and Ocean Avenue itself, a history that dates back to the region's earliest settlers, the Montaukett Indians. According to legend, the Indians once believed the land now known as Ocean Avenue to be a power spot, perhaps even an area infested by demons. Tribal enemies, or those said to be possessed by evil spirits, were left to die on this land and then buried face down, cursed to stare for all eternity into the dark abode their spirit was sent to join. Montaukets believe there is good and there is evil. The spirit is very movable and it can come and go and do a lot of things. Jay Anson's The Amityville Horror documents another legend about the Ocean Avenue property, one dating back to the Salem witch trials of the late 1600s. According to this account, a man named John Ketchum, after being forced out of Massachusetts for practicing witchcraft, set up residence on or near the spot of Amityville's famed House of Horrors. It is said that Ketchum continued his alleged devil worship until his death, and that his body may be buried somewhere on the property. Early deeds do suggest that Ketchum may have existed, but whether he fled from Salem or ever practiced witchcraft on the land cannot be verified. 
We were never able to physically connect the Ketchums who were burned at the stake in Salem, Massachusetts. But it's very interesting that there's a Ketchum Street or a Ketchum Place right in the immediate vicinity of the residents. In about 1924, the house at 112 Ocean Avenue was built for John Moynihan and his family. But what isn't commonly known is that this house, which now stands just a couple of blocks away, once occupied the famous Ocean Avenue lot. A house built in 1782, which had been moved because of continuous problems with the people in the house. They moved out, they uh, didn't stay very long. Representatives for the Amityville Historical Society, who refused to appear on camera, insist that the only reason the original house was picked up and moved was because Mr. and Mrs. Moynihan needed a larger house to accommodate their growing family, not because of any paranormal disturbances. But what of the house that stands on the lot today? Coming back to 112 Ocean Avenue, the families that I found had resided in that dwelling place appeared to have a calamity within each one. There was a drowning off the bulkhead in the back. There were problems for each family. Since access to death certificates is limited under New York state law, the deaths said to have occurred on or near the property could not be confirmed leaving people to speculate about the true history of the house on Ocean Avenue. In the summer of 1965, the house at 112 Ocean Avenue is sold to the DeFeos, a close-knit Italian Catholic family. It is a prosperous time for the city-bred DeFeos, a prosperity evidenced by their move from a small Brooklyn apartment to the six-bedroom, two-and-a-half-story Dutch colonial on Long Island's affluent South Shore. The book High Hopes, the Amityville Murders, an in-depth examination of the DeFeo case based on interviews, police records, and sworn trial testimony, takes its title from the sign posted on the DeFeo's front lawn. I think they were more than middle class, and I'm sure when they moved from Brooklyn, when they bought that house, that they had high hopes. The DeFeos have five children, John Matthew, Mark, Allison, Dawn, and their eldest son, Ronald Jr., better known as Ronnie or Butch. Ronnie had a close relationship with his mother. His relationship with his father was a love-hate relationship. Mr. DeFeo's way of showing love to his children, especially his eldest son, Ronnie, is by spoiling them with money and material things. It would be nothing for his father to give him, you know, a $1,000 uh, for him to spend. He never really had to work. He had a lot of jobs that he lost. He wound up working in the car agency for the father, but he didn't have to. I think they thought that money would make the difference. Look how wonderful our life is, but it's not very wonderful. Material excesses and family discord may not have been the only forces at work in the DeFeo home. From the very beginning, Ronald DeFeo Jr. senses that he is not alone in the house. Well, when I first moved in, you know, uh, you start hearing noises and different things at night noise, you know, like you thought, thought somebody might have been walking around, pipes banging. Oh, they were always screaming. Somebody's in the house, ghost, all of them. Once in a while you'd hear screaming, but there wasn't nobody screaming. According to trial testimony, by 1973, the incidents of violence and abuse within the family begin to escalate. Ronnie's mother was downstairs doing laundry, but the kids were making a tremendous fuss and she was yelling at the kids, the kids were yelling, and the father kept yelling at her to shut up. He wanted to eat his meal in peace. And she comes up the stairs with a basket of laundry, and the father walks over to the stairs and punches her in the face. She falls down the stairs. She closes the door and he says, now we'll have some peace, we can eat in peace. And that scene, for me, 
summed up what life must have been like in that house. Desperate to escape his troubled home life, Ronnie immerses himself in Long Island's South Shore bar scene and the early 1970s drug subculture. He was um, into heroin. He was big into speed. Uh, he had used, uh, he would take LSD. So I think he was a very heavy user and he probably started very early. As Ronnie spirals out of control, one family argument nearly turns lethal. All sorts of violence is going on. Ronnie's sister Dawn and her father are having a violent argument. And so Ronnie's going to settle the argument. Picked up a shotgun. I, I knew the gun was loaded. You know. And I said, that is it. I want to kill him. And it turns out there are bullets in the chamber, but nothing happened. So the father felt that was the wonderful miracle. His son didn't kill him. In a show of devotion, Mr. DeFeo surrounds the house with religious statuary. But is it divine intervention or something more sinister which impels the family to seek help from the Catholic Church? They felt the devil was in the house. That's what brought all that religion into the house. Mr. DeFeo went to St. Joseph's Shrine six months before he was murdered to bring back a priest who would say the prayers of exorcism in his home. And from all the information I learned, candles were toppling over, doors were opening and closing. A letter from St. Joseph's Oratory in Montreal, Canada, states that they have no official record of this incident. When people asked Mr. DeFeo why he had all these special holy statues around his home, he said, it's because I have a devil on my back. But was Mr. DeFeo referring to the devil incarnate or to his deeply troubled son? Maybe it was fear. Maybe it's that, is it possible that down deep they all loved each other? Or that it's something he didn't want to face, that his son could be capable of murder? Whatever the source of their fear, the DeFeos seem to have an uncanny awareness of the terrible fate soon to befall them. Lynn Nanowitz, the housekeeper to the DeFeo family, stated to me on several occasions during the trial that Mrs. DeFeo told her that there was going to be a terrible tragedy occurring to her family. Desperate to escape his tumultuous home life, Ronnie moves out of the house on several occasions. I start getting cold and vicious inside. No, it seemed to be the whole problem was originated and ended in that house. The problem was that Mr. DeFeo used all his resources, all his connections, to go out searching for his son each time and dragged him back to the home. This was just helping the volcano become more violent within Ronnie. By the early days of November 1974, tensions in the household reach a breaking point. Just days before the murders, he and his father had an argument where his father referred to him as a devil. Uh, it came close to blows. Ronnie stormed out. And you know, you know, to say, if I don't get out of here, I'm going to kill all of you. And he did. November 13th, 1974. While his family sleeps, 23-year-old Ronald DeFeo Jr. sits in a darkened room watching television. The television program he was watching was an army movie called Castle Keep. And in this picture, the last 15 to 20 minutes is complete destruction of the American and German troops. Ronnie said that during this movie, he heard his family members whispering and he thought 
will believe that they were conspiring to kill him. At or about the end of the movie, he said that a person with black hands appeared and gave him the rifle. And he went ahead and he proceeded to shoot each member of his family. No, I shot my father first, then I crossed all once my mom was down the bed. After that, I tell you honestly, I couldn't stop if I wanted to. I couldn't put the gun down. So I felt somebody was inside moving me. He went into a, another room and shot his two younger brothers. Then he went in and shot his younger sister. And then he went upstairs and shot his older sister, Dawn. When it is over, six members of the DeFeo family, Ronald Sr., his wife Louise, daughters Dawn, 18, and Allison, 13, and sons Mark, 11, and John Matthew, 9, lie slaughtered in their beds. The following evening, Ronnie himself reports the murders. Citing his family's alleged mafia connections, Ronnie is taken into protective custody. Within hours, however, he confesses. News of the tragedy spreads quickly, leaving friends, family, and the entire community devastated. There was enormous shock. I think it's still one of the things for which Long Island remains infamous. At DeFeo's trial one year later, defense attorney William Weber tries to prove that his client was legally insane at the time he committed the murders and therefore not responsible for his actions. Ultimately, the jury finds him sane and guilty on all six counts of second-degree murder. Yet even as Ronald DeFeo Jr. serves six consecutive 25-year-to-life prison terms, several troubling mysteries about the murders remain. To this day, no one is certain how Ronald DeFeo Jr. killed his parents, two brothers and two sisters, and nobody heard a thing how none of them even woke up. Maybe they were drugged. No, that proved not to be true. The next theory was that, well, he had a silencer on it. That theory didn't hold water. There would be some fragments of the silencer that would have been left on the crime scene. Except for the DeFeo's dog barking, nobody heard a thing. Well, how do six people get killed and there are no gunshots? One possible explanation is offered by parapsychologist Hans Holzer. When there is a strong psychic field, sound will be inhibited. We know this from other cases because the electromagnetic field, which is uh, representative of an entity of this kind, does interfere with, this, with the perception of sound, and sound was not heard. Others believe that the position of the six bodies bears an eerie similarity to the local Indian legend, which holds that tribal enemies were buried face down. An Indian curse, some say, may have driven Ronald DeFeo Jr. to murder. Young DeFeo had always been uh, very high strung and certainly given to psychic ability. And uh, it is not inconceivable that uh, the influence in the house were manifested gradually through him. I think the entity tried to get him out of the house because the house was on, on sacred ground. Town officials and the local Indians themselves dispute any notion of curses or sacred burial grounds. Yet no matter what questions remain, the village of Amityville will be forever linked with these tragic murders. There isn't a day that goes by that I'm not asked questions relating to the DeFeo case. This was a tragic incident that happened to a middle-class family, a family that could very well have been my neighbor, your neighbor, anyone else's neighbor. So I think that's the essence here, is that this was an American family that was wiped out by the oldest son. After Ronald DeFeo's trial and conviction, 
The people of Amityville believed the horror was over. It had just begun. In the summer of 1975, newlyweds George and Kathleen Lutz begin house hunting on Long Island. George, a 28-year-old ex-Marine, runs his family's surveying firm. Kathy, 30, has three children from a previous marriage. Daniel, 10, Christopher, 7, and Melissa, 5. Although the Lutzes have only a modest budget, the real estate broker talks them into viewing a certain Dutch colonial overlooking the water on upscale Ocean Avenue. This is the first interview the Lutzes have granted in more than 20 years. We first saw the house in the fall of 1975. Went over with the broker. She said, I wanted to show you what the other half of Amityville lived like. Pulling up to it, she starts to tell us things that the house had as far as the number of bedrooms. When we walked in the house, Kathy looked around right from the foyer and just started smiling. She really fell in love with the house. It was very obvious. And we walked through, it had six bedrooms and a boathouse for our boat and two-car garage and a heated pool and a basement on the water, which was very rare. All the things that we talked about, we found in one place. For George and myself, we could bring more things together within this marriage. A new home, space for everybody, space for growth. Only after George, Kathy, and the children fall in love with the house does the broker mention its gruesome past. And she explained to us about the DeFeo massacre and wanted to know if that would change our view on the house at all. We discussed it among the five of us and there was no problem. It was, you know, it was unfortunate that that had happened there. It was reflected in the price, of course but we weren't superstitious, thinking that there was anything wrong that way. There was a sign outside the front of the house when we first looked at it. It said, High Hopes. And when I look now, those same high hopes were within us. On December 18, 1975, 13 months after the murders, George and Kathy move in with their three children and the family dog, Harry. A friend of George's, after learning of the house's tragic history, insists that he get it blessed by a Catholic priest. Lutz, a Methodist, calls upon the only priest he knows, Father Ralph Pecoraro. I first met Father Ralph, which we came to know him as Father Ray, when I was in the process of obtaining an annulment from my first marriage. He and I became good friends. On the same day the Lutzes are moving in, Father Ray comes to bless the house. I was blessing the sewing room. It was cold. It was really cold in there. And I thought, gee, this is peculiar, because it was a lovely day out. It was winter, yes, but it didn't account for that kind of coldness. It wasn't until much later that we learned what it was that had happened to him while he was doing that. He did stop us before leaving and say to us that not to spend too much time in that sewing room for some reason he felt uncomfortable there. I was sprinkling holy water and I heard a rather deep voice behind me saying, get out. Get out. It seemed so directed toward me, I was really quite startled. Get out. I felt a slap at one point on the face. I felt somebody slap me and there was nobody there. Christmas, 1975. For the Lutz family, the lovely house at 112 Ocean Avenue is a dream come true. But from the day they move in, they begin to detect the house's strange sensations. All homes have sounds that you need to come adjusted to. Hollow water sounds, a dishwasher in the middle of the night, there's sounds that all homes have. As the holidays draw to a close, however, the sensations in the house grow increasingly ominous. After the love of Christmas came down, that's when the sounds in the house were different. They weren't ones that I wanted to become familiar with. 
be changed. There wasn't the warm glow anymore. Now there was a blaze. It was a scraping. And there was a banging. The children who had been anticipating a holiday were now anticipating different things that brought a fear onto their face. We each saw things so drastically different than the person right next to us that it was very hard for us to communicate even as a family. When I look back sometimes, I describe it like a three-ring circus, each one being in their own room or their own area of the house, experiencing for themselves something different than what the other person was. George is attacked by a sensation of intense cold. He compulsively builds fires in the living room fireplace, but he can never get warm enough. He became obsessed with how much firewood there was, and then would there be enough to keep burning, that he would be continually going about the fireplace, checking the fire. Fights break out between the normally loving family members. Slowly, each of their personalities begins to change. In the ensuing days, the family is subjected to a series of strange and inexplicable events. Extreme fluctuations in temperature, 